Yeah, hi. Good evening. Yeah. So we'll are most of us from cities or how many of you would say you're from a town or a city? How many is that about more than 50%, right? And how many of you from villages? That's a smaller percentage. And have you all been reading news reports about how India is getting more and more urbanized? More people are moving to the cities. And what is normally the source of water for a city? River. Most cities are located close to rivers. So, and how many of you are from the north of India? That's a good number. East? This is one. Okay. Two. And west? Fewer. And south? Okay, so we have many from the south and many from the north. Okay, good. Since we spoke of rivers, which is the longest river flowing in the country in terms of distance traveled within the country itself? Easy answer, so don't worry too much. Yeah, Ganga, which is the second longest river flowing in the city, flowing within the country? We, the length traveled within the country. Yes, it's right. Godavari is the second longest river that flows entirely within the country. We're just calculating the distance that the river travels within the country. Since we're doing it the third, Krishna, fourth, for, that's for the north, really in the north, Indus, actually, oh great. So okay, beyond that, even I don't know. So we'll just move ahead. So this is for water that comes from rivers. Most of us live beside rivers. What are the other sources of water for a city? Bore wells, right? Bore wells, that's, that's really groundwater. It could be a bore well or it could be an open well. It's groundwater. These are simple questions. And uh, somebody said ponds. Do any of you all actually take water from a pond or have you all done that? Because you all are lucky. The ones who get to do that are quite lucky. It's not In the city, you often don't get to do that. Ponds and lakes are more for recreation. You don't end up using water from a pond because surface water bodies are either contaminated or, and what else? What can be the other source of water? Rainwater, yes. And uh, did it rain here today? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. And for students of statistics or mathematics, otherwise, we, we do all know the rainiest place in the country, right? Uh, now it's Mosin Ram, but Cherapunji is right. So getting, actually, and how much does it rain in Cherapunji? Any idea? Sorry, say it loudly. It actually rains about 11 meters. To get a sense for it, in Bangalore when it rains, it rains 970 millimeters or 1 meter. So 1 meter being about 3 feet, right? And in Cherapunji, it rains 11 times that. So, yeah, and it's 11 meters. So 11 meters, about 33 free feet. It's like a three-story building. So just imagine the volume of water that it rains there. But recently we got a uh, we got a call for help from Cherapunji. They are out of water and they are drought hit too. So when it's not raining, there's no water. The children go to school. First there were no toilets. They built toilets, but then there was no water in the toilets, and so children didn't go to the toilets anymore. So and just imagine the potential for it. A lot of what I'll be speaking will not be very deep science, but it's about water, cities, simple things that we can manage but a need for citizen science, where more and more people participate, understand simple things like this. Like I'm sure you all can imagine how much is 11 meters of water. But a lot of people say here in Bangalore, if I were to tell them that you get one meter of water. Let's say we'll hold one uh, question that you'll hold through the presentation and whoever gets to the answer first can tell me. So if you were a person in Cherapunji, living in Cherapunji, and if you were a person living in Bangalore, how much area would you need such that if you harvested all the rain that fell in that area, that would be enough for your family of four or five people for the entire year? The question is clear. So some these people on this side think you live in Chirapunji. The people on that side think you live in Bangalore. You get one meter of rainfall. You get 11 meters of rainfall. Yeah, and there's a family of four or five people. How much water would they need in a day? We'll cover it as we go along. So as you read, I'm not telling you how much we need in a day. So depending on how much water they would need in a day, how much land do they need? And this is not just a theoretical question because we also think of how much land do we need to grow our food? How much land do we need to have fresh air? How much land do we need? Uh, 
uh, to have water as well and to live and grow our clothes and if we assume that we need uh, food, clothing and shelter, how much land does each person really need? And that is an important question going ahead more as we think about sustainability. So coming to that, uh, I'm with a group called the Biome Environmental Trust, a little bit about ourselves. Uh, it's a group that's largely Bangalore based, but we've been fortunate to do, I also went through some of the student list, I think one of you was from Tripura. So we've had a chance to work in many of the states that were mentioned there. Largely our focus is on seeing how can people manage their water sustainably. And what does sustainably mean? Like some of you said, can you do rainwater harvesting? If so, how do you do rainwater harvesting? How much does it cost? How much does it benefit? And yes, when we spoke of sources of water, we missed one more source of water. Anybody? Yeah, okay, seawater in, in certain parts. In, in our country, are we using seawater for domestic purposes anywhere? Anybody knows? Go ahead, don't, don't be afraid. I mean, we know the answers, we don't know. These are, these are not uh, trick questions. Or Are we using seawater in our country anywhere? Do you think so? That we are using. So in Chennai, there's a desalination plant, yeah. So we'll talk about that also as we go. So yes, the sea is a source of water. A lot of countries in the Middle East actually use seawater. They desalinate it. But there is a lot of cost in terms of energy, material, what happens to the wastewater that comes out of it? How does it affect the sea when it's thrown out? Those are all questions to think about. But one more source of water. Yeah, we did rain. Rain, snow, hail, let's say we count all of that as one. We did rivers, we did ponds, we did groundwater. We spoke of sea water, yeah? Springs, yes, natural springs also, especially in the hilly regions. But they're also a source of groundwater. These are all different forms, either as a spring or a geyser, or as a, when you take it out forcefully from a, a groundwater extraction source like a bore well or a well, these are all ground. So there's one more source of water. We can look at it as a source, or as, a, as we go along, we'll talk of it as well. And towards the end, you can give me that answer as well. So there is one country uh, that uses that as a source of drinking water. We've not spoken about it as yet. Yeah, so moving ahead, what we do, a lot of what we do is about, imp we work with, yeah, some thoughts, we want sewage, yeah, sewage as a source of water. So the water that we use, then which is rich with nutrients, what real, and the questions that I want you all to think about also is, what really is the right thing to do with sewage? Is it a problem? Is it a resource? How do you look at it in your own homes, in your towns or villages, cities, wherever you are? If you have seen it, we can share a few stories if there is something interesting you want to share. And the, the focus today also is to think about when you all go out into the world and do whatever jobs you do, what do you hold as principles? What really, if I'm harvesting rainwater, is it really okay for me to harvest all the rainwater? Who does the water belong to? Groundwater, if I dig a bore well, pump it out, who does it belong to? Is it mine? Can I uh, drink it? Can I sell it? If I dig deep, I find gold. Is it mine? Does it belong to other people? So just to, just to think of all these issues as well. Yeah, no, not issues, these things. And then just make your own decisions. So very simply coming back to we, that toilet that you see there, that's a waterless toilet. So we try and encourage people. Anybody who's used it in part of any camp. So it's called an eco-sand toilet. How can you use a toilet with less or no water at all? We like to speak a lot, lot to students, starting from really small ones to older engineering students as well, government schools. Then we implement rainwater harvesting it's also a group that believes in sustainable architecture. So the idea, like I told you, how much land do we need to build our homes, to get our water, to grow our food? So the thought also is that let's say I'm in a, if I'm here, probably I'm sustainable if I keep my footprint really low, right? I, I source everything from as locally as possible. But then if I'm going to build steel or glass from elsewhere, obviously I'm upsetting the balance somewhere. Maybe it's okay, sometimes I may take a call, but if we really imagine what would be sustainable architecture, is it possible to build with the soil that comes out from the land itself when I dig for my basement or when I dig a pond? And if so, if I were to make bricks out of this, or can I build with this? Not that it has to be a village house. Can I think, apply some technology to it? 
and make sure that I'm building with local resources itself. So some of those pictures there, we may not see a whole lot of it because I'm not, there's a group amongst us that works largely on sustainable architecture. I'm from a group that works on sustainable water management. Okay, so those toilets and then in all parts of the city, how do we work on groundwater recharge? So that's broadly some of the work that we do. Feel free to stop me at any time or ask any questions. That's the whole fun of it. Okay. Now, when we say that you would have heard this right from your standard one that you should wash your hand, whatever, don't leave the tap on when you're brushing and things like that. But it's useful to know how much of the world, what of the water that is used in each country, how much is for domestic use, how much is by industry and how much is by agriculture. So if you really look at it, 70 per 70, 80, 90 percent of the water use in the entire country is really for agriculture. So if you could reduce the water demand there, there is great potential in terms of the water that can be saved. And then there is industry and actually the domestic water use is really quite minimal. But this number again was as of the year 2000. When you go forward, you see as we become more urbanized, what's really happening is that the domestic water use is increasing, the industrial water use is increasing, and actually the agricultural water use is also coming down. But a country as at large, we are still short of water. Another small question can be, how much water do you think this room can hold? And for simplicity, we also assume that it's a cuboid. And then for us to imagine how much water a city needs, how many times this room. Can somebody hold that as a question too? That we'll maybe kind of midway at around 4.30, I'll ask you all the answer to. How much water can be held in this room? Just take a guess to me. And then we'll imagine how much water, let's say a city like maybe Bangalore needs or uh, somebody from Bombay, then how much might Bombay need, Calcutta, we we'll just think about it. So take down, unless you already know and you can estimate. Fine, so moving on. And this is really a simple exercise because uh, before we go to the next slide, how, do you know how much water a person needs in a day? Anybody? Yeah, so 70, 75 is the number. So there are standards that are set. So when the, gov when the state plans for itself, normally in rural areas, they see, say every rural person needs 70 to 80 liters per person per day. But, and I don't know why they make that difference, but in small towns, you're said to need less water per day. And in big towns, you need, the person needs more water per person per day. So what is the number for a city? So what you said is right for rural. So in a city, they say you need more water. So let's say in a bigger city, how much water are you? Are you planned for? How much does the city plan for you? More. Yeah, about 150, 135 to 150 liters per person per day. And these really are your inputs for the other question I asked you. So I'm looking forward to the answer from the Cherapunji group of 11 meters and from the Bangalore group of one meter rainfall. So about 150 liters per person per day is the water requirement in a city. And then they say how much you need for hand washing, toilets, blah, 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 how much you need. And what do you think we need most water for in a day, in a city? Drinking is a very small, you drink maybe three, four bottles, three, four, five liters. Not even for bathing, unfortunately it's for flushing. Yeah, so especially there are different types of flushes, but if you, if you total it up, do you want to say no? Can you say that? Yeah. Yeah, I don't. What does it say? Flash player? No, I'm just saying. Yeah. So rural is actually 55, not even 70, 80. That must be a good question for us to ask them. Why? What is it that the city people do differently? And why are they having longer baths or flushing more often? But you can see that in many ways in a rural area, you can live a, a, with a much smaller footprint because you can grow your food locally, you can keep your footprint really small. Unlike in a city where, unfortunately, everything that we need has to come from elsewhere. But so, yes, we do need a lot of, and these are averages, of course, and this is how the town plans for itself. About 40 liters is what we need for flushing. So, 
So the same thing uh, about where does my water come from? We spoke about it, but we'll just go through it a little bit. Mm. It's strange that every city actually gets water from very far away. And what do you think is the reason they get it from very far away? Yeah, because you want to get it as, because the closer it gets to you, the more contaminated it starts to get, because the cities start to contaminate the water. So you want to pick it from the source as far as possible. For most cities, however, you pick from a point that is upstream from you. So the water flows by gravity. But in a city like Bangalore, the water is actually pumped up. Yes, so are you all, some of you from, I think not many, right? There weren't many from Bangalore, I remember thinking of that. So Bangalore is one of the few cities where water is pumped up from a lower height to a higher height. Yeah, so that's Hyderabad. Mumbai. That's uh, Bangalore, where it gets its water from, from the river Kaveri. But for all of us, we just see our water coming from a tap. The tap in turn comes from an overhead tank. You all have seen all of this, right? I'm just making it simple because some of you may not have seen it. Most houses have to have this overhead tank. And how does it go to the tank? It goes from an underground sump. So when the water comes, you store it. So just calculate the kind of, as much as we think of our footprint in terms of the water. One is the water is coming from so far away. But then even the way the city supplies it, it goes up and down. They store it in a reservoir. Then they pump it to an overhead tank. Then you store it in a reservoir. Then you pump it to an overhead tank. And then it finally comes and then that's when you use the water. And of course, some people don't have taps and in which case they have to get water from either stand posts or other tankers. And then sometimes when the city is unable to supply water to you, you or even if they do supply to you, you may have a bore well or a tanker that supplies water to you. And these are old open wells. So we'll speak a little bit about this as well. And the need to understand, even though we know so much about various places on the earth, we don't understand our groundwater very well. So the knowledge, what is called hydrogeology, that's fairly low. On a, on a very, um, th there is knowledge, but in a way that it can be understood and utilized by people, the knowledge of that is still very low. Yeah, so you could get, and this sometimes we think are clever people who do rainwater harvesting. Because what's the advantage, this, and this is not a make-believe picture where you see that lady uh, sitting with the sari. This actually happens in the hills in uh, Kerala, where the water that you need just for that day for you to drink and cook is stored and then she's able to use it because otherwise she'll have to walk a long distance down to go and get water. And what happens after the water has been used? So this is the bit that we were speaking about. Actually, uh, most of the water, other than your drinking, cooking, all your bathing, flushing, washing clothes, utensils, all of that water goes waste. Um, have some of you all seen a sewage treatment plant? How many? Okay. Fine. Yeah. So, since we spoke of it, there are three forms of treatment. It's, it's very, fairly simple. And it's also useful to try and build some of these systems ourselves. Uh, because if you look, like we saw in the previous... Other than, say, your flushing water, if you really imagine, your bathing water, your washing clothes, washing utensils, and to some extent, even your cooking water uh, is of reasonably good quality. You don't have to strive very hard to be able to clean it up. So sometimes we work in, with schools to be able to set up treatment plants such that at least your hand wash water can be treated very easily and reused. And uh, normally sewage treatment plants, there are three levels to which it is treated. Primary, where you're largely just separating out the solids and the liquid. Secondary, where you've treated to, uh, have you heard of BOD and COD? You basically increase the amount of oxygen in the water, then you can release it into the, uh, uh, into the environment. Then if you treat it to tertiary standards, you can even ideally use it for drinking and cooking. But normally it's used for what's called indirect portable recharge. So you put it into the ground somewhere and then you pull it out again as groundwater and use it. But really what happens in a city 
in most cities it just flows in a drain where it mixes with rainwater and then some of it may go to a sewage treatment plant but a lot of it just ends up going to lakes and tanks in the neighborhood. Yeah. So as we go along I would also like for you to think up of if we say uh, there were two questions one is how much water is there in this room I'm just repeating it again because I want you to imagine in terms of that rainfall and the water that family needed finally to link up to how much water might be there in the room yeah don't think of it in terms of the shape simplify it to be the cuboid that it is and think of those people in Austin Ram who got 11 meters of rain and just repeating it because I'm hoping but of course, I'm sure some of you are smart enough to do it mentally, but I'd like some written information and the last 10 minutes, we can just discuss that as well. Okay. And this very simply is about the source of all water, rain. Yeah. Um, how much rain does the country, and how do you do averages for rainfall? It's really quite uh, tricky because uh, if you look at annual rainfall, normally what is said is that you need to look at the last 30 years rainfall data to be able to arrive at the average annual rainfall. And uh, there is a, and another very good source of data is an organization that's not very far from here, at least for Karnataka, that's the Karnataka State Natural Drought Monit Disaster Monitoring Cell. So they have set up 7,000 and I noticed it, I was coming from the south of Bangalore all the way here and I could see the way the rainfall kind of continuously changed as I came here. There were parts of the city that were dry and I actually had an opportunity to drive through the entire place as it was raining. And they have been, they have set up 7,000 rain gauges across the entire state. Yeah, and they've set up earlier in the entire city of Bangalore, there were only two rain gauges. And so based on that, you would say, okay, this is how much rainfall we received in a day, 30 millimeters or 60 millimeters. But when now there are 200 rain gauges in the city, and you can very clearly see that the south and the east of the city gets a lot more rainfall than the northwest or center of the city. And that's where, and you can also start to see which places are flooding. There are some very interesting citizen science websites which tell you how much it is raining, which are the standard flooding points, what can you do to deal with this flood. So this rain is a tricky one, it's both a friend and a foe. It's a really good friend because we desperately need it. But if not managed well, it can lead to flooding. And then suddenly people are wishing that it never rained at all and places didn't get flooded at all. So these are a bunch of simple slides. I shan't spend a whole lot of time about how when there were more forests, water would percolate into the ground where there was more green cover and would flow below ground level. And that really is this kind of base flow, what you see as the base flow and the interflow. These are important flows to happen below the ground so that a river can flow. So when a river dries up, often, what are the reasons why a river dries up? Sand mining, okay. Why because of sand mining? How does it dry up because of sand mining? Sand mining is good, right? Sometimes I think it's good. You're removing all the silt, now the river has more place to flow. Hmm? Think about it. Any other, why does a river dry up? Sorry? Increase in temperature, so maybe it's evaporating. Yes, that could be a reason. What else? Deforestation, because when forests hold water and they slowly release it over a period of time. But even then, at least in the rainy season, the river should flow irrespective of deforestation. What really happens in deforestation is in the dry season, the flows are reduced. Somebody said something else? Dams, yes. Dams hold the, so many rivers now don't reach the sea anymore because they are dammed upstream and the river does not get to flow. But one of the important and invisible reasons which we don't think about is really groundwater extraction. So when you remove water from inside the ground, you're actually sucking up water from the surface as well. So that's the interflow base flow that you see. When water stops flowing under the ground, then the river on top also dries up. So for a river to flow on top, the region around it has to be completely saturated and there have to be base flows. And when all of that dries up, that's when the river starts to dry up. So as you can see, as we construct more, then your surface runoff increases. Surface runoff leads to flooding, but surface runoff also gives us a larger opportunity to harvest rain. So same thing, at one point you have scarcity, the other side you have flood. 
Anybody knows, I told you that in Bangalore it rains one meter. Did you hear of the rains in Bombay in 2005 or 2006 when the entire city flooded? Do you know how much rain they received in one day? How much rainfall? And all that you all know, right? Rainfall is measured in millimeters or meters. And why, if you will come to that as well, maybe. Yeah. So in Bombay, how much did it rain in a single day? Okay. It rained the same one meter. So what Bangalore receives in the entire year, that means one meter, in one day it rained that much. Then you can imagine the kind of flows it will generate going and if the water is not able to empty out into the sea and if in places you are lower than the sea level, you can imagine the kind of flooding that can happen. So while these are the problems, you also have to think of what are the solutions, how do we deal with each of these. So yes, there is and you see a tanker going off when there's rain. So it does make sense to harvest rain. It's very simple. The sari is just an imagination. But it's really about the area where the rain falls is called a catchment. Then you have to convey it somewhere with pipes. You can filter it. Then you can either store it and reuse it or you can do groundwater recharge with it. And that's just the rainfall numbers. Uh, to tell you in that pre, we are actually in Bangalore, you all are fortunate to be here. It's one of the more rainier months, which is a non-monsoon month. Okay, and uh, should not show the slides of how much I can harvest. We'll quickly, so that you all can think through that. And rainwater, unlike popular imagination, can actually be pretty clean. Um, will it be clean? Rainwater, is it clean? Yes. Yes? Okay. When is it clean? If it falls on the ground, then it becomes dirty, right? But while it's falling, it's reasonably clean. Or is it, anybody has any questions? No, fine. And they can be, it's okay because, it, I, yeah, sometimes people say, sorry? Yeah, acid rain, and that's important for us to know, has not happened in India over the last 10 years. And it happens only in very scarce conditions when there is a whole lot of industrial pollution. Yeah, and there can be a little amount of acidity in the water as it falls because it dissolves some of the components, but for it to be severe enough to cause any problems. So many times, so of course, and that's an important thing to consider when there is atmospheric pollution, when the rain falls, some of it dissolves in the rainwater. So even in the process of storing that water, we allow for that first rain to not be harvested. It's called first rain separation. So if you have a clean roof, you can harvest it. That's a filter. Yeah, that can be a simple filter. You can store it. You can use it for groundwater recharge. What you can't use, you put it out into the drain. So that's simple. You join pipes. Um, that There can be filters that are made in different ways. This is a first drain separator in this case. So what happens is when the rain comes from the roof, it flows down here. You kind of cap it so that it cannot flow out from here. Only after it fills this pipe, then you collect it in this drum. So you're making sure you can do it in various ways you can design it. But the important thing is that the first few millimeters of rain you do not harvest. Okay, And we will skip all of this. You can have very simple filters made of charcoal, stone, sand. And uh, it's not just theoretical. How many of you have rainwater harvesting systems in your home? So that would be a nice project for you all to go back to really try and see. Because especially when the rain falls, it's very easy to connect the pipes, to filter it, to store it in your existing storage structure itself, or to use it for groundwater recharge and how that works. So yes, I'm just showing you a few images of how, and these are all filters that people put together themselves. And there are some filters that are commercially available, a company that makes filters. And you can filter it and store it either in a drum or in a large underground tank. These are all some images here. I mean, you can have larger tanks. What you see here is these are all the filters. In this case, also, you can have a much larger filter. So the design of a filter requires some thought because rain does not always flow at the same intensity. Sometimes it's raining heavily. Sometimes it's raining slowly. Rain intensity is measured in millimeters per hour. So when it's raining upwards of 60 millimeters per hour, you say it's a heavy intensity rainfall. So it, when you design a filter, you have to take care that the filter is able to, unlike a regular water filter, where your rate of inflow is always the same, in rain there is a lot of variation in rates of inflow. So based on the contaminants that you expect, you have to design your filter appropriately. This is a filter, this is the storage itself on which people are sitting. And then rainwater can be pretty clear for use. 
And next we come to ground water. Now ground water, it's contamination. And in a city, because it's an important source of water, what can we do about ground water? Mm. So we will just simply explain. So in most, and actually um, in the north, for instance, in the north, so there are different kinds of ways in which water is held in the ground. Okay, if you go anywhere on the Gangetic Basin, because it's been depositing silt for so long, largely you'll see that the groundwater table is very high. And it's it's in almost in your top soilish layer. So largely soil can be divided into this area, which is called the top soil, which is normally not very deep. This is where most of the roots of your trees, plants, some kind of contamination from the upper surface can exist. Below that we have what is called the weathered zone. And this is across the country actually. And then when you go below, you find rocks with cracks in them. These are called the fractured zone. And water exists in these cracks. And as you go deeper, these cracks reduce. And then you may not find uh, water anymore because there are no more cracks. But then sometimes people, what they do is if there is there's a process of hydro fracturing by which you can create fractures in, in this layer, and allow for more water to percolate and we'll speak about groundwater recharge more. So the deepest wells, how deep do you think they are? You know, this figure has it. The deepest wells from which we are getting water are about 600 to 700 meters deep or about 2000 feet deep. Those are the deepest well, yeah, 600. How deep is it to the center of the earth? Yeah, and just imagine how less of that we have covered. And how deep have people drilled so far? 12 kilometers. So just to set it in perspective, some and a lot of people think that it makes sense to keep digging deeper to get water, but actually no, beyond a point what we've seen and what more and more people are saying is there are very few fractures to hold the water. So really your best bet is to hold water in this weathered zone where the, uh, the water is not held in cracks in the rock, but it's held in the soil itself. So it's really like broke, um, imagine like when you go to a beach and when you're close to the sea, and even if you come away from the sea line and you dig, you get some water, right? So largely this permeable zone is somewhat like that. Water is held in the spaces between the soil. And if we were to saturate this layer, there is a great potential for us to be holding on to groundwater and withdrawing groundwater as well. And often what we don't think of is that the way we see groundwater, what we contaminate kind of comes back to us. So there is a great need for us to understand what's happening on the surface as well. And we don't think much of groundwater, but actually more than 80% of India drinking water, that means our domestic water is really coming from groundwater yeah and most a lot of the irrigation water is also coming from groundwater so there is a need without getting into the numbers as much there's really a need for us to be able to put more and more water into the ground and depending upon the geology of the place that we are in we need to decide how can we put this water into the ground such that finally we are able to get it back as well not just for ourselves but that's how a bore well is dug when a borewell motor has to be removed, the motor goes 1000 feet into the ground. And when you have to remove it, that's how many people you need and a tractor to be able to pull the motor up, though it doesn't weigh as much really. Now that's how complicated. Just to tell you that borewell digging and all of it is, and it costs a lot of money too. If you were to dig a borewell now and put a motor, there's something called a casing. Uh, have you heard, you may have heard some of these terms and why we put a casing. But it, it costs a fair bit of money, it costs anywhere between 2 to 4 lakh rupees to dig one bore well, which is going 1000 feet or deeper into the ground. And then there is no guarantee of water being available back to us. Whereas if you do, so what we often tell people is that nowadays what happens, everybody who digs a, uh, makes a house for themselves will invest another 2 to 4 lakhs to dig a bore well for themselves. But the bore well doesn't guarantee you water. It's only if somebody has to put water into the ground so that people can take it 
out instead. So oftentimes we tell people that instead of the 4 lakhs for the bore well, if you invest 40,000 for the recharge and more and more people invest in recharge or along with your bore well you put another additional 40,000 for recharge. But if participatorily people can manage their groundwater, because when I dig a bore well and get water out from it, it's not water that's coming from right below my ground and even if it did, does it belong to me? No. Yeah, does the air, the entire column of air that goes all the way up above this, does it belong to me? No, right? Beyond the point, it's that airspace is not mine, beyond this. So, it's really a really small patch above and below that belongs to me. Then in which case, how do you look at groundwater? Whose responsibility is it to make sure that groundwater is recharged? It's collective responsibility. And should we appropriate that responsibility to the government or as citizens, what is it that we have to do? So quickly going through these images again, but however groundwater can also be like this, almost at ground level, this is an open well full of water. And this is not new, this well is from, can anybody guess? It's from Sarnath, it's supposed to be from the time that Buddha was around. Yeah? So maybe Buddha drank water from this well. And even in the rocky digs of Ashoka, you often hear about the need to dig wells. Of course, then they were thinking of withdrawal, the need to plant trees and dig wells. We now interpret it to mean wells that can also put water into the ground. So these are images from across the country. This is from Jharkhand. These are, this is from Bombay in a very crowded place. But still there's a vegetable market and there is a well. People are taking water out from that well. This is from Maharashtra. This is not far from here because over a period of time when these wells stop yielding water anymore, we start to treat them as dumps. And, and this is a well in Kutub Minar. Yeah, that, so it's just full of plastic water bottles. But the thought really is that we have this infrastructure available for ourselves. And if you think in terms of the total volume of water that these wells can hold and compare it to the building and compare it to the volume of water required and the rain, rainfall endowment that the entire country needs. Are there better ways in which we can manage our water? That's really the question. So what is it that we can all do? Starts from our own, what happens to our toilet water? What happens? How do we learn about groundwater? What role do the scientists play? Many other things that we have to think about. But one of the simple ways is digging these recharge structures or using existing wells to put water into the ground um, and often as, as much as the science of it is important, there's also communities. So there are communities of well diggers and because even to dig a well, you need to dig straight down. You can't dig it slanting. You need to make sure it doesn't collapse. So there is science and technology and wisdom there. So we try and work with the communities of well diggers to make sure that as in wherever there's rainwater that's flowing, if it be a stormwater drain, be a rooftop, a park or a garden or a lake, can you create structures to put water into the ground and do simple filtration mechanisms that people can see and maintain themselves. That's also a well. These are all images of wells that have been rejuvenated and be in urban areas. And you can imagine what would be the diameter of this well. This, is about, this well is 60 feet across in diameter, about 100 feet deep. And imagine the volume again. So these are all certain images. And sometimes we think, uh, if, if you imagine this as the urban swimming pool as well, these wells are really dangerous to swim in unless, but they are good places to learn also because you can't afford to sink. And uh, a lot of children do, and these are images from current times, wells can also be created in very small tight spaces in urban areas, can be both a source of water as well. So in this, in this case, this is the compound wall, this is the uh, home itself, and he's created that well there. And that's the source of recharge as well as groundwater. Um, every, the need for every city, town, village to look at its groundwater. Here in Bangalore, we are running a campaign called a million wells for Bangalore for groundwater recharge to deal with flooding and to do uh, to increase the water table. So how do you how do you inc uh, and a lot of us growing up may not have seen these open wells because they started to be closed and they stopped being sources of water as well. So the important thing to think about is what does an individual do currently? What can a city do? And what, because even if you imagine, if you just say we have to do rainwater harvesting and hold all the water to ourselves, what happens to people downstream? So that's also a question about when you dam rivers for ourselves 
some water for the river for itself just to flow right and that's really for the plants animals vegetation everything that we do not fully well understand even now in the western ghats every once in a while you'll get a newspaper article saying new species of frog discovered and then i think to myself is this just born newly or people discovered it newly or how does that really happen so there is so much more that we don't fully well understand so the question really is how much is it okay to harvest how much water am i entitled to because rainwater harvesting has this tricky thing if i have a large patch of land i'm getting a large patch of water but am i entitled to hold all of that to myself is that fair how much can i store and what would naturally happen on a landscape as well hmm? so we want to answer this we'll do all of this in the last little bit of discussion so it's really about the principles around groundwater who owns it what does collective responsibility mean hmm? then this was that last source of water that we all spoke about what happens to a waste in the city and so it's an apartment that is the depiction and uh, waste water often in apartments or homes either goes into a yeah where does waste water go anybody in a those from smaller villages might know if you're in a rural home where does your waste water go anybody wants to say small town or and it's fine it's that's how it is so there is no way not where does the waste water go okay from a, somebody else who knows back no don't go that far yes it does go back to the river but where does it go immediately it comes down you flush then where does it go underground pipes okay then where does that underground pipe go go ahead say that ha huh? say it loudly doesn't matter maximum you're wrong yeah tank yes those concrete sometimes what you do is you build a concrete tank it's called a septic tank why is it called septic it's built in a way such that something from outside can't come inside something from inside can't go outside so you're holding all the sewage over there yeah from this septic tank then what happens well you can't hold it right beyond the point how much can you hold that's also because even as much as we think of how much space we need for a water we also have to think how much space do we need for a waste and all the waste that we generate not just human waste but in the food that we cook and everything else that we do and because that's very important for town planning every city as it develops if you're going to put say 10000 people in an area you need to plan for where they're going to get their water from where they're going to put their waste what's going to happen to the sewage sludge so yes it goes to a septic tank in sometimes it just goes to a pit yeah it's a, a pit is just a hole in the ground so you can put rings there are various ways and ways you can make this pit in the pit the solid settles to the bottom decomposes the liquid just seeps out into the ground yeah those are but as people start to stay closer and closer and you're taking water from here and you're putting your sewage out there that water starts to be contaminated that's when you start to make those tanks that's when sometimes to take those tanks out you call this kind of a truck we call it a honey sucker which pumps it out and takes it away in some time sometimes you also have sewage treatment plants in in the place where you stay where the sewage is treated the treated sewage and we'll see that is sometimes used back so this is what takes it away and it takes it away and just dumps it in a drain and yes it flows out in many rivers which is why you always pick water from upstream in a river and never downstream in a river because you know that by the time it's gone downstream it's carrying all your waste and then it flows in our river streams and then when it's flowing often times the farmers are smart enough and they then use it to grow crops then sometimes the scientists or the people in the city will say this water carries so many contaminants how do we know it's safe there could be helminths there can be heavy metals and then you get the fruits and vegetables tested but if you logically look at it if this practice itself this is a common practice if you if you make sure that your waste water is not contaminated to an extent that it's going to contaminate the soil or the water then if it were to be used for agriculture and safely by the farmers that apply it or the people that cook it clean it and subsequently use it or maybe you don't use it to grow food crops or vegetables what if you were growing mulberry with it and then the silk worms ate it and you grew up silk from it instead or you used it to water trees or plants where the food is not so it we think of it as fertigation because there is water that's coming 
which is nutrient rich and all even where you all you all are here if you look around in places where there are small drains it's often this, these pictures are not very far from you it's used for growing flowers so there, there is value in which so that that's also defining how cities could manage their wastewater and these are simple systems that can be built on a home rooftop itself to treat wastewater and reuse it so that's that's getting a little bit into what we can do a little responsibly and that's really what happens now and we are trying to see if a city can do that so the city wastewater this is the sewage treatment plant which is getting water from washing machine toilet sinks after it is treated that water is used back for flushing so almost 40 liters of that 135 liters can be used back for flushing and then you use some for gardening and the remaining can you send it over to a lake or a water body why do you think that's okay if the water is of good reasonably good quality it's okay right and how would you know that it's of good quality Yeah, so these are things that are still being tried out. One is naturally when systems are not in place, the water does flow out into water bodies, rivers. But now people are trying what's managed wastewater. So you take the wastewater, treat it, fill up lakes, then uh, 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 close by to the lake, you're able to extract groundwater. If you've put reasonably good quality water in, by the time it filters through the soil, is available. So there are two factors that go away. One is the soil is able to treat it. Two, even the yuck factor is gone. Because if you wanted to use this water right around, there would be a little bit of, can I use this wastewater directly? But that's what is happening when we spoke initially in Singapore. In Singapore, they treat their sewage water, they bottle it and sell it. It's called new water. So like we buy bisleri water or what aquafina water, they buy new water, which is nothing but their treated sewage. But they are so confident that they can bring it back to drinking water quality standards. So here you can also use nature or ask nature to help you a little bit. You put it into water body and then take it out and use it. So these are some examples in Bangalore itself where this is a lake on 11 acres. It, get eight, it gets 8 lakh liters every day from an apartment sewage treatment plant then further they've made these small floating wetlands which in turn draw out nutrients from the water and they need to be harvested and used and then the lake is full the groundwater is uh, recharged because the lake is full and uh, yeah there is a fisherman in the lake he leaves fishlings uh, up to one lakh fishlings can be there in a 10 acre lake when they grow back up you can sell fish and uh, fish sells at um, on an average it sells at about 200 rupees a kilo. So yeah, and also to tell you, these are all urban lakes. So if you imagine, uh, the real thought is, how do you imagine an urban city for its water requirements, keeping in mind all the sources of water that we spoke about, and how can it continue to do, why, why do we all want to live in a city? Like what happens in a city and why, why are more and more people living in cities? Better job opportunities, right? Yeah, better. What are those facilities? Right. Yeah, you get electricity, water, but increasingly what's happening is you don't necessarily get as much electricity and water. You're stuck in trans uh, traffic. You have bad quality air. You get bad quality water. You end up paying more for water. But however, if we imagine a city differently, and which is what the original, the title of the slide was, that if we look at water, and earlier there used to be practices around water, where water was revered, or you there were reasons why you wouldn't... Uh, dig a well near the toilet or you would say, I'm not saying dig it on the east or northeast, but there were a set of principles about how you managed water. And sometimes what happens when we live in a city is because everything is externally managed, we are not able to see these relationships because I am not fishing in this lake, I'm not swimming in this lake, maybe I'm going for a jog around the lake. And if it stinks so much, I go somewhere else. So how do we plan our cities? such that we are connected because cities can still be and most of the cities in our country even though they are so built if you've read in the report uh, newspapers recently uh, kejriwal trying to revive the wells in delhi uh, revive the lakes in delhi so in every city still because we all grew up from other smaller villages there is great potential to be able to revive water bodies and actually look at it in an intelligent way using with the fishermen and the birds because the fishes in turn clean up the lakes, then for the fishes, the birds come, 
let the birds eat some the fishermen take some but can there be an can there be a way such that all stakeholders are kept reasonably happy yeah and then grass grows but the moment you have waste water there is grass in the wetlands uh, these are again some more images of floating wetlands that have been created and with the grass there are uh, livelihood options for people making mats and other arty crafts around the lake and these are various ways when when you're cleaning out the lake deweeding the lake and also the nutrients that are there from the waste water when it is dried the sludge is dried it turns into good compost that's then taken up for urban farming or even in the peripheries of the city it's taken up by farmers for farming so the same questions around waste water like and now there are also questions about who has the first right to waste water i'll tell you it may seem very right to treat all the waste water and use it yourself but uh, there are people who are depending on your waste water downstream so for instance in uh, if you all are some of you may know the state of karnataka and tamil nadu are at uh, fight because of the river kaveri yeah so now not only for the fresh water there is a fight but there is also a fight for the waste water because what bangalore is planning to do is to take all the waste water that used to earlier flow out from bangalore and again flow through the state of tamil nadu as a different river called the dakshin pinakini instead they are thinking let's take our waste water and fill up all our lakes but then what happens that waste water doesn't flow downstream and every day the city generates 1500 million liters of water and that's the water that will stop flowing downstream which then stops agriculture or whatever has impact downstream below so to think about what we can do and what are the principles that we should go by so thankfully that's thank you words